Well, let me start this morning by telling you a story that is pertinent to our text today. Go back with me into Israelite history. If you'll remember, there are three kings in a united Israel. When Israel, all the 12 tribes were together, we have the first king, his name was what? Saul. It was the people's choice, right? And then David, well, that was the Lord's choice, a man after his own heart. And then David's son by Bathsheba, Solomon, whose heart was led away by foreign wives. Well, Solomon dies in 931 B.C., and if you know your history, you know what happens. There is civil war. The kingdom is divided from the north into the south. The north is called Israel. The south is called Judah. The ten northern tribes are part of the Israelite kingdom. Judah has Judah and Benjamin. Israel, the north, has no good kings. Judah has a few a few good kings. One of them, the best of them, was a boy named Josiah. Josiah ascended the throne at the tender age of eight years old. To put that in perspective, that's Claire Mordecai. And yet, this boy has a heart for the Lord. You see, Judah had fallen into gross idolatry. The former kings, especially Manasseh, had taken them down a very, very dark path to Baal worship, worship of the Asheroths, Molech, Chemosh, child sacrifice. It was horrible. And yet, this boy Josiah, even at the tender age of 16, began to make reforms. And by the time he was 20, he was making some pretty serious reforms, so much so that they were extremely unpopular with the culture of the day. Let me read you a few. He threw out of the temple and burned the vessels made for Baal. He threw out the idolatrous priests and slaughtered them. He destroyed the idols, the high places of worship, the cult prostitution, destroyed their houses. He destroyed the places of worship for child sacrifice, pagan art. He defiled and destroyed pagan temples. He ran out the mediums and the psychics and desecrated the graves of the idolatrous priests. This boy was serious about zeal for the Lord. Then at the age of 32, after cleaning house across the country, he decides to fix up the house of God. It had fallen into disrepair. And so he instructed the people, he instructed the priests to collect the money, to count it, and then to pay the workers, trusted workers, to fix the house. And while they were counting the money to pay the craftsmen, the high priest found something. Let me read it to you. You don't need to turn there, but 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 3. Now in the 18th year of King Josiah, the king sent... Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, the son of Meshulam the scribe, to the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to Hilkiah the high priest, that he may count the money brought into the house of the Lord, which the doorkeepers have gathered from the people. Let them deliver it into the hands of the workmen who have oversight of the house, and let them give it to the workmen who are in the house to repair the damages on the house." And then Hilkiah, the high priest, found the book of the law inside the temple. You say, what? What do you mean he found the book of the law? He found the Bible in the temple. Yeah, isn't it supposed to be there? You see, the law, the copy of the law, the first five books of the Bible, set right beside the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies, where the high priest would go in once a year on the Day of Atonement. But that wasn't the only copy, but that was the really important copy. And yet, he says 
to the scribe. I have found the book of the law inside the house of the Lord. And they went back and told the king. Look what we found. Josiah said, read it to me. Shaphan the scribe read it. And the king heard the words of the law. And he tore his clothes. You see, he had been living with zeal for the Lord because of what he knew, what had been handed down, what his mom and dad had taught him. But he didn't have the Word. He didn't have his Bible. All of Israel didn't have their Bible. For 70 years, they did not have their Bible. Now, some of you are like, well, yeah, I lose my Bible. Yeah, from Sunday to Sunday, you, you, you forget it's in your car. And your small group leader says, how's the quiet time going? You're like, oh, well, I, I heard it Devo on the radio where I read my phone. But can you imagine not having the word of God for 70 years? And not only that, apparently they didn't even realize it was gone because they didn't even look for it. It was neglected. Well, if you thought Josiah's reforms were strong earlier... He ramped it up after that. He gathered all the Israels of Jerusalem at the temple and invited all the people to come and listen. And in one day, he read the whole book of the law. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. He realized that without the book of the law, without the covenant this nation was nothing. This nation needed to hear the word of God. Amen? And there was revival. And there was fervor. And there was desire. And there was real passion to obey this covenant. So much so that the people said, we commit to believe. We commit to hold fast to this covenant. We've heard the words. We will respond. We will respond in obedience. And they did. But it didn't last. It didn't last. And they fell back into disobedience. And it only, it only had gas as long as Josiah was pushing it. And it is against this backdrop that Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, writes. And you're saying, what does this have to do with Hebrews? We'll look down at your text. See the block lettering? That's Jeremiah. That's Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah's got a ministry that's frankly pretty depressing. There's been revival under Josiah, but then they fall off and, and the people fall back into sin and judgment's coming. Judgment is serious judgment is coming. And Jeremiah is talking about it. And then he writes this, starting in verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws, like the ones they found, where? Into their minds. And I will write them where? On their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. The Old Covenant, as great as it was, and it was great, it is the law of the Lord, it was incomplete. It fell short. And so you may ask, well, but why was it incomplete? Why was the old one not as good as the new one? Why is this new one better? What does any of this have to do with the book of Hebrews and this little Jewish church enduring persecution that is thinking about going back? Watch this. To the Old Covenant. You start to see the connection there? Those are the questions that we want to answer today. Why is this important? We're not Jewish. We're not thinking about going back to the Old Covenant. What is the difference between the Old and the New Covenant? Well, let me bring us up to speed 
Verses 1 through 13 are really one pericope, one unit. And we did something unusual in that we split it. They were supposed to be back to back, but we, we had to jump into Colossians 3 for the conference. So when we come back to it, we need to understand what's going on. We, we have been in a section talking about how Jesus is the superior high priest. He is the greatest of all high priests, not according to the order of Levi, but according to the order of, do you remember? Melchizedek, that's right. And in verses 1 through 13, they specifically cover how he is superior in his ministry and how the new covenant is better. If you'll remember, this is a small Jewish church being written to by, we don't know whom, but we know that he's a preacher. And this is like a sermon. And he's saying, hold fast. You're drifting. And drifting has a destination. Persecution has come upon them. No one's died yet, but they've, they've lost property. They've lost reputation. Clearly coming out of a Jewish background, they've been kicked out of their synagogues. They uh, have been considered dead by their family. They've probably lost lots of relationships. They've lost their business. And now persecution's ramping up. And they're starting to ask themselves, is this whole new covenant, Jesus as the Messiah, is it really worth it? Isn't there a way that I can, I can say, I like Jesus, he was a great teacher. Maybe he was uh, some sort of a prophet, maybe uh, uh, some sort of a a little bit higher than the angels, maybe some sort of an angel, but, but to call him a Messiah is costing me too much. I'm thinking about going back. I kind of miss the liturgy anyway, right? I miss the synagogue. I like the Havna and the Gila, right? Sometimes these new Christian hymns, they just don't do it for me. I miss the matzah. I miss, I miss just the old times. This is costing me too much. And so the preacher continually exalts Christ and exalts the new covenant and exalts him as the great high priest. And if you'll remember the last uh, text or two, we talked about how the old priesthood, what did they do? They had to offer sacrifices year after year uh, that, that could not save. The old priests are dead, whereas Jesus Christ ministers daily in the throne room of God in the temple in heaven. And he does so for his bride. So we saw a little bit in verses 1 through 6 about how Jesus has a superior ministry. Today we want to see why our new covenant is better. And it's so much more applicable than uh, is readily visible at first glance. Look at... Uh, Verse 1 again, chapter 8. Now the main point in what has been said is this, that we have such a high priest who has taken his seat. Remember, priests don't sit. He's taken his seat because it is what? Finished. That's right. At the right hand of the throne of the majesty, that's a place of prominence, of authority. A minister in the sanctuary in the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, not man. Now, Look down at verse 6 that sets up our text for today. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, there's the first part, by as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted on better promises. So if you want to just think about this as far as what's going on to the original audience and then how we can apply it to today, these Jewish Christians are either thinking about punting the faith or more likely continuing to drift from the faith. And what they're drifting from is the new covenant. And what they're drifting to is the old covenant. And that kind of brings it into perspective. The problem is, is that the old covenant doesn't actually work. Just to be completely blunt, the Old Covenant doesn't actually save, whereas the new one does, because it's built on better promises. Our timeless truth, the church holds fast 
to the new covenant, knowing it alone provides reconciliation. You might want to write down that word reconciliation because that's the key. Three simple points. The old is incomplete. The new is complete. And the new makes the old obsolete. The old is incomplete. The new is complete. The new makes the old obsolete. Verse 7, look at the old is incomplete. For if the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion sought for a second. So right about now you might be asking, okay, well, if the old covenant was incomplete or, or it, 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 it didn't get us across the line, should I just get rid of my Old Testament? Should we all just turn in our Bibles and, and say, no, no, this is too heavy to carry anyway. I'd rather just have the thin line New Testament from now on. I mean, it's a logical conclusion, right? If the Old Covenant is obsolete, if the Old Covenant is incomplete, why do we even need the Old Testament? Does that mean that the law was bad? Now, we know the answer to that, but can we defend it? Can we defend the purpose of the Old Testament law? Because there's been plenty of Christians, albeit moving towards heresy in centuries past, who, who would have said, the Old Testament is, is, is not important. We're done with it. In fact, that, that's maybe even a different God I've heard before, which is completely heretical. But we know that the law was not bad. Turn with me back, if you will, to Romans. Let's dive into some deep systematic theology here for a moment. Romans chapter 7. Paul's answering questions that he, he knows are about to come up. And he knows the next question in line is, does that mean the law is bad? Does that mean that law is the cause of death? If law was a standard by which God requires righteousness, a perfect righteousness, in order to be in relationship with Him, does that make the standard the cause of our death? Because we've all fallen short of that. Are you with me so far? Okay. Look at verse 12. So then the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Therefore, did that which is good become a cause of death for me? And Paul cries out, no way. No, no, no possible way. The law is good, but my sin is bad. And if you know this text here, you know the second part of Romans chapter 7 is something we all like to gravitate to because it talks about Paul's great struggle, right? And when we're failing, we say, ah, like Paul, I do that which I do not want to do. God help me, right? Well, let me give a disclaimer. Christians struggle. Just be real clear. Your pastor is not talking about sinless perfection or that Christians don't struggle. Christians struggle, okay? But Christians don't consistently fail. And I agree with the first four centuries of the church and with newer scholarship that says Paul is making a point here. If you look at chapters 6, 7, and 8, he's making a point here that when I was a Jewish Pharisee and I was trying to, to obey God on my own, when I was doing my own bootstrap religion, I simply could not do it. Like the the Jews, like the Israelites during the time of Josiah, when that revival was so great, but the obedience was dependent upon them, they could not maintain it under the Old Covenant. I think this is what Paul is saying in the second half of Romans. The law is good, but it cannot transform us. The law is not the cause of death, but watch this, neither does it bring about life. Okay? So the Old Covenant is good, and that it shows us God's wonderful standard. It shows us that we have earned death. But that law, that Old Covenant, does not transform us. Only grace transforms us. And we cannot do it on our own. No matter how much you try, apart from grace, you cannot save yourself. 
bootstrap religion will not save. Now, one more disclaimer here. I'm not saying people didn't get saved in the Old Testament. Or, or somehow they were saved a different way. Clearly they did. And they were saved by grace through faith in the coming work of Jesus Christ. Abraham believed and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. What I am trying to say is that the old covenant was external. It was 613 do's and don'ts that were to show God's holiness and were to drive us towards a need that God was going to have, us, have to save us because we could not do it on our own. The reason I say that is because if you look, let your eyes fall down to chapter 8, verse 1. What's our favorite verse there? Therefore, say it with me, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We love that verse, right? We have to remember there are no chapter breaks until the Middle Ages. This all flows. Paul's saying, law is not the cause of sin and death. I am. Law is the standard. The law is good. But the law won't save. It cannot transform. But God, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The old covenant was dependent upon my obedience. How's that working for you? Right? My obedience, apart from the Holy Spirit, apart from the saving work of Jesus Christ, apart from His imputed righteousness, yeah, failure all across the board. Failure, failure, failure. The old covenant was incomplete simply because it was dependent upon our obedience. And we are failures. But we're going to get to it in a minute. But what is the new covenant dependent upon? Jesus Christ's obedience. So in painting that picture, now look back at chapter 8, verse 1 again. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Watch this. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. And then here's the kicker in verse 3. For what the law could not do, weak as, though it, as, weak as through the flesh, God did. For what the law could not do, what the old covenant could not do, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as an offering for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Simply put this way, what we could not do on our own and we stood condemned, God did. By sending Jesus Christ who took on our condemnation and now because of his obedience, because of his sacrifice, we can now fulfill the law. Our obedience is a result of his obedience. Those of us who walk in the Spirit by the power of the Spirit and by his imputed righteousness can fulfill the law. Not perfectly, but progressively. That's what the new covenant does. It's because of his obedience. The bootstrap religion could not save us, but grace can. Grace transforms us. Look how the old covenant was flawed. Flip back to Hebrews chapter 8, verse 8. You'll see what I mean. The old covenant was conditional. For finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. For they, what? Did not continue in my covenant, and I did not care for them, says the Lord. So does that mean the law was bad? Paul says, no way. In fact, in Galatians, he says, it became a tutor, a schoolmaster, to point us to the cross. As I mentioned a few weeks ago, it became that big neon sign saying, you 
need grace. The law is to show you not only God's standard, but you could do it on your own. And the old covenant was saying, go for it. And we fall flat on our face time and time again. The new covenant, Jesus said, it's done. The new covenant is complete. Look at our second point. Back to verse 6. Why? It's founded on better promises. Now, there's two reasons that the new covenant is better. So now we've kind of understood the old covenant, its shortcomings, how it was necessary, but it wouldn't save and it wouldn't transform. But now, Christian, can you tell me why the new covenant, can you tell me why believing in the person and work of Jesus Christ for salvation and for sanctification is different than all other world religions? I mean, you get that question from your friends, right? Who are you to say, dot, dot, dot? Well, that's your interpretation, dot, dot, dot. Well, aren't you arrogant to say Buddhists are going to hell? Anyone else felt that pressure here? And frankly, it's because we as Christians don't understand deeply the power of the new covenant. What God did through the Lord Jesus Christ in giving us the new covenant of grace. It's founded upon better promises. It's complete. It's, um, you might say, it's successful. It gets us across the finish line. It completes that what no other religion can. You think about it, what is the end goal of what we believe? For anyone, not just Christians, but for anyone. It's reconciliation. It's reconciliation with our Creator. How does one find forgiveness before a holy God? Ask it to anyone. Everyone realizes that is the conundrum. Salvation, then, is that belief system that reconciles us with God. That the the canyon that could not be bridged because of our sin and His holiness is bridged in the new covenant, is bridged in the cross. And it's complete because of two things. One, it ensures a new relationship. Write that down. It ensures a new relationship. Verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their minds and I will write them on their hearts. Where was the old covenant written? Stone tablets. Top of Mount Sinai, right? Where's this new covenant written? It's written on our hearts. It's written on our hearts. The old covenant said, do not kill, do not commit adultery. The new covenant didn't lessen that at all. In fact, it says, if you've killed someone in your heart, You've already done it. If you've looked upon a woman with lust, you've already committed adultery. God's standard of holiness was in no way minimized. The chasm was just as great. But Jesus bridged it by living the life that we could not live and dying the death that we deserved. And it is through His obedience that this new covenant gets us across the line. It actually puts us in a new relationship. I mean, think about the difference. The the Old Covenant had a a mixed congregation, right? It was in a theocracy, the Israelites. Some believed, some didn't, and it was just this this mixture of um, what does Jude call them? A disobedient, stiff-necked people, right? Uh, And they could come to God through priests and through sacrifices. But, But what do we have, Christian? What do we have? How many of us prayed this last week? How many of us have a a relationship with our Lord that we can enter that throne room any time, day or night? 
How many of us are able to simply confess our sins knowing that they've already been paid for? We have a new relationship. We are His people. One is, is Sinai and the other one is Calvary. I used to have a good friend of mine, an evangelist, and I, I love this guy. He was about this tall, uh, Brazilian, and just, just fiery. And, uh, and he was so passionate about uh, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that if I ever said anything that sounded remotely Old Covenant, he would be like, Rod, Rod, I smell Moses on you. It's dusty. It's old. You, you need the grace of Calvary. And there was some truth to that. Sometimes we have a tendency to forget how great the new covenant is, especially in comparison to Sinai. Laws written on stone tablets, rituals and sacrifices and protocol and festivals and feasts in order to approach a holy God. And now we can cry out what? Abba, Father. That didn't just happen. God didn't just change his mind. He sent the Prince of Heaven to make it happen. That's the new covenant. This preacher's saying, why the heck do you want to go back? Why do you want to go back to Sinai? He's calling him on it. He says, you want to go back because it's easy. Because you feel like you've done something when you do that liturgy. You want to go back because you don't want to take the persecution. When Christ was willing to die to effect this new covenant for you. Because you smell like Moses. Verse 10 again. And I will be their God. And they shall be my people. Think about what happened. Christ had seven sayings from the cross. What was the last one? It is finished. And he yielded up his spirit and there was an earthquake. It went dark and the veil in the Holy of Holies ripped from the top down. Everything's changed. Everything's changed. And I would say we as Christians, even looking back at this text 2,000 years later, have a tendency to take it for granted. This is the only understanding on this planet where God effects salvation through the obedience and sacrifice of God himself. To drift towards anything else is the height of dishonor. It's the height of ingratitude. Let me give you an example. Think about it. You're one of these Jews, okay? You're one of these, these Hebrews that's become a believer, and, and we think maybe this is in Rome. You're in a little house church. You're hearing about this persecution going on. You're starting to get nervous. You miss your old family and friends. You miss the synagogue softball games, okay? And you think, I want to go back. If I go back and I want to have a relationship with God, who do I have to go through? The priest. Right? If I want to get my sins forgiven, quote unquote, I have to go sacrifice. And yet listen to what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2 for those under the new covenant. You, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. They will be my people so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You're a priest. Have you thought about that? Under this new covenant, I don't need to go see a priest. I am part of the priesthood of all believers.
If that doesn't blow our mind, we don't realize how great this new covenant is. This is a new relationship, something that we've never seen before. And as if that's not enough, the new covenant also ensures real forgiveness, not just pictures of it, but real forgiveness. Verse 12, for I will be merciful to their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. As far as from the east is from the west. This preacher is going to pick up the same quote again in two chapters, but he's going to add something to it. You don't need to turn there, but listen to Hebrews 10, 17. And their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now watch this. Now, where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. If these guys go back to the old covenant, they also have to go back to the old sacrifices, right? It is finished, no longer applies. And yet under the new covenant, we have a new relationship because there is real forgiveness. And if you think about those two things, that adds up. It's like a Christian algebraic equation to reconciliation. New relationship, real forgiveness. We are reconciled to God. Romans 5.10, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we will be saved by His life. Verse 20 of chapter 5 of Romans, The law came in so that the, that the transgression would increase. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. The new covenant is enacted on better promises. What's the promise? Jesus' obedience, not ours. If I understood nothing else, the old covenant, it gave me a clear picture of how bad off I was. It gave me a clear picture of how hard it would be and impossible to get to God because I could never be obedient. It was conditioned upon my obedience. The new covenant, it is finished. Christ did it all. All I have to do is bow the knee in repentance and faith. Finally, the new covenant makes the old obsolete. Verse 13, when he said a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete, but whatever is becoming obsolete is growing old and ready to disappear. Now, obsolete is the word worn out. It's, it's the same uh, Greek word used in the Greek Old Testament for talking about the clothes had not worn out, even though they had been in the wilderness 40 years, or that things wear out like a garment. So the old covenant is worn out, meaning it, it won't do its job anymore. It never could. From a salvation standpoint, the old covenant could never get you to the promised land. You think about that? It could never get you to the eternal promised land. It could never cross the Jordan. Why? Because your obedience could never get you there. And so it's, it's becoming obsolete. It's being replaced by the new and improved. But as I mentioned, that doesn't mean that the law is bad, or even as Christians that we don't use it. This is not just story time in the Old Testament, okay? This is one reason why at Metro we preach a lot out of the Old Testament. But the law has three uses. Have you ever heard of the three uses of the law? This is a good just side note here. Okay, something a little extra you didn't have to pay for, but I'm going to give it to you. All right. Three things. It shows us the righteousness that God requires for a relationship with him. That's the first use. The second, it, re it restrains evil in society. Even Thomas Jefferson, who was not a believer, said, man will be restrained from without or from within. What does the law do? The law restrains even the most unregenerate heart from without. This is why we have laws, convictions, people go to prison. 
Finally, and here's the key, and this is why the Old Testament is so important. The law is a window into the character of God. The law is a window into the character of God. The Old Testament law tells us what God likes and what He doesn't. It tells us what God appreciates, what He values, and what He rejects. So interesting, we've been talking a lot about culture lately, especially Christian culture. Have we violated this part, this third use of the law? Do we have a tendency to say, yeah, yeah, that, that sin's not so bad. This is not that big of a deal. Hey, God, I know you seem to say that's real important, but, but you know, that was a different time, different era. The Old Covenant was incomplete because it simply could not accomplish what was promised. You know, as great of a guy as Josiah was, and he was great. I mean, if you look at all the kings, there's like David and like Josiah's right there. This kid was faithful. I think he was king for like 31 years. But he simply could not lead people to do it in their own strength. He tried to establish a kingdom based upon the old covenant. What do kings do? Kings establish and advance their kingdoms. And he took the old covenant and he just couldn't do it because it was dependent upon the obedience of the people. Even with the best of intentions, they could not, in fact, they would not complete that which they had begun. But you know, 600 years, there was another king, a good king, an even better king, a perfect king, King Jesus, who established his kingdom based upon the new covenant and not based upon his people's obedience, but based upon his obedience. And this kingdom, well, the gates of hell will not prevail against it, right? It is because of his obedience and the imputation of his righteousness and the power of his Holy Spirit that we are now able to respond in obedience because it's already done. He's already got us across the finish line. It's because it's not dependent upon us. Even when Paul says in Philippians 2, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, dot, 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 what does he say? But is it, it is God who is at work within you. I'm going to coach you strong. You need to be obedient. But hey, realize, perseverance of the saints is in reality preservation of the saints, right? It's the Holy Spirit doing it. So now, how do you think this might impact a little church undergoing persecution? This preacher wants them to understand that what they're about to go back to not only will not save them, okay, watch me here, but it will not carry them through persecution because it is based upon their own fleshly obedience. But when we are in Christ, He perseveres us to the very end. That's, that's grace. Grace is not just at justification. Grace is the power of God to save a man and sanctify a man and take him all the way home to the promised land to glorify him. The old covenant won't actually reconcile. And death is on the line, to quote Prince's Bride, okay? It won't bring you into the presence of God. Oh, you may feel better because of the liturgy. You may like some of the songs, but it doesn't actually work. This preacher is saying, you need to hold fast, not to Sinai. Sinai's in the rearview mirror. You need to hold fast to Calvary. It is Calvary that saves. It is Calvary that fixed that anchor to the throne room of God. 
And if the church is a rowboat in a tempest being tossed to and fro, the chain that goes to that anchor will hold us steady. Why? Because our great high priest is holding on to it and he's holding on to us. Those Sinai priests, they're dead. They're dust. If I could just appeal to unbelievers among us for a moment, let me tell you how applicable this is to today. Some of you, while not trusting in the old covenant, are trusting in your own good works, your own obedience for salvation, and you smell like Moses. It will not save you. It will not bring forgiveness. It certainly will not bring a new relationship or reconciliation. And you will not persevere. All of that, when dependent upon you, will result in failure. It is time to depend upon someone else's obedience. Jesus Christ. That's what salvation is. Let me just be very, very clear. Salvation is actually giving up trying on your own. It's giving it up. It's saying, I can no longer do it. I've been unable to do it. My good works are as filthy rags. They don't get me to first base with our holy God. It is time to depend upon someone else's work, someone else's obedience. You know, the interesting part of this history here is that Josiah was faithful to the end. He was a good king, but his people weren't. And as a result, the old covenant did not save them. Josiah dies in 609 B.C. Upon his death, one of his sons takes over and is immediately controlled by Pharaoh Necho of Egypt. That king is exiled. His other son is put into his place, but Egypt rules the day for the next four years until a general named Nebuchadnezzar comes along and over a period of many years has three sieges against Jerusalem and destroys the whole place, burns the temple to the ground and takes all the people into exile for, you want to guess how many years? Seventy years. God was not finished with his people. And what they could not accomplish on their own and in their own obedience, God did. And 600 years later, he did it at Calvary with our Lord Jesus Christ. And his obedience inaugurated a new covenant. And what we see here in Hebrews is not only that he has not forgotten about his people, but he did what they could not do. And then look around. We were grafted in as part of it. We who were far off outside the camp were grafted in, not based on our own smarts or our own obedience, because of God's sheer mercy and His Son's obedience. And we are partakers of the new covenant.